there was a recent study that actually showed that in advanced economies, things are really actually quite bleak. It slowed significantly, especially since the financial crisis. I think the biggest example we have is that in the five years to 2002, productivity gains averaged 2.2% a year. In the period through 2007, that slowed to 1.6%. And you might think that that's really bad, but actually in the decade to 2022, that is slow to less than 1%. So it doesn't look really good for the global economy right now. Um, maybe it doesn't look so good for companies that are trying to increase productivity. And all of that is happening at a time when we need productivity the most. We need productivity to increase to fight inflation. And we obviously need that to you know, pay for a costly but much needed energy transition. Um, for most people here, that will sound horrible. But for AI, it's a huge, huge, huge opportunity. So I think that's. One of the things that we want to talk about, um, we have Michael Fercaro here, MasterCard's chief um, people officer, and he's here to talk today to us about his experiences. Michael, thanks for being here. Walk us through what MasterCard is doing, how it's using AI to improve its internal processes, and give us a few examples. You know, for a lot of us, it's like AI is a bit, what is really AI, you know, is a little abstract. Yeah, sure. So great to be here. And um, so in my role heading up uh, human resources for MasterCard, um, there's two aspects to it. One is really looking at what can I do to improve the experience for our employees, our candidates, our managers, so the internal workings of HR itself. And then the other piece is really looking at how do I enable and support the rest of the organization and how they're thinking about deploying AI tools for increasing revenue or improving efficiencies in the workplace. So there's a couple of ways of looking at it. And I do think um, the way that we're, we're talking about it today is um, there's two parts. One is around productivity and the other one is around experience. So from the, the people perspective, one of the pieces of work that we've done over the last couple of years um, and one of the pain points that a lot of organizations face is around how do you how do you solve the problem that most people have around career development, right? How do you really make sure that you've got a, a mechanism in place that can make it easier for your employees to find jobs um, that are interesting in your um, organization than it is then going to another competitor or another organization? So we implemented a, um, a talent marketplace. Um, and this talent marketplace essentially is two sides of a ledger. On the one hand, you've got the demand. Uh, which is driven by the employees. And so we have, in the three years, 80% of our workforce now that have put their profile on this platform that basically has you know, their experience, their interests, their aspirations. And on the other hand, you've got the supply side, which is essentially managers that are saying, I've got these particular projects um, that I'm looking for excess capacity in the workplace. That was the, the start of it. Now we're putting jobs as well on there. And what the tool is doing is basically matching people's interests with the, or, and experience with the projects that are available there. And that we've seen a huge increase in terms of people being deployed into projects, uh, cross-border projects, working on projects that are not within their particular domain. It's helping us from a diversity perspective because you're getting different ideas and innovation and creativity there. And then you're also, uh, we're seeing an increase in terms of retention of that particular talent. About a third of people that have been in those particular projects have actually moved jobs as well. So it's actually satisfying that particular need. And we're looking to continue to expand uh, the use cases within that talent marketplace. So that's sort of one. The other one that we've done more recently from a workforce perspective is looking at how do we deploy tools at scale to actually help in productivity in the workplace. So we use Microsoft and Microsoft Teams. We have put a, um, a pilot of Copilot onto Microsoft Teams. We have about 300 users at the moment. Um, and within the, the first 28 days, we're seeing that um, about 96% of those um, users and going into Copilot and using it to do things like reviewing their emails, uh, writing or drafting uh, a Word document, or basically drafting an email. 
And, uh, and the early statistics are showing that within that 28-day period, we've seen about uh, 1,200 hours of, uh, of, of time savings, about four hours per person during that 28 days. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you can see there's only three particular uh, use cases that we've got using Copilot at the moment. The, the multiplier effect of that is significant in terms of the use of it. So there are a couple of the ways uh, that we're using it at the moment. There's many, many more examples that we, we can share later on. If I can pick on your first example, I think it's really interesting that you're talking about the cross-border and how employees are going from, you know, one part of the organization to the other to do particular tasks. But obviously we know that the elephant in the room for AI is jobs. Is it going to replace humans? Um, you know, are people saying, oh, there's someone else coming into my field? So how has it, you know, the interaction and the reaction of the employees being to this tool? Yes, yeah, so in terms of the, the appetite and the... Um the receptiveness of the, of the tools and what AI is, it's extremely positive. We're essentially a, a technology company and therefore uh, the use of these tools to supplement or augment their, their jobs is seen as a positive. We've seen also in our um, customer care centre, the call centre area, um, and we heard one of the panellists earlier share some of uh, his experiences as well. We're actually seeing that um, even the, the routing of, um, of case uh, volumes into using natural language processing um, into the, the right places, instead of it taking days to, to move those, those calls, it's actually taking minutes or hours. And so it's actually reducing a lot and with about 80% accuracy. So we're doing this as a, as a test and learn of about 20,000 cases uh, over a couple of month period. But this is actually a, a positive thing because the, the contact center employees, we know that typically they suffer a lot from burnout um, and repetitive nature of the role. We're actually seeing higher retention and we're actually training the employees up to develop uh, these chatbots and these, um, these tools to actually help them to continue to do their job but actually focusing on higher level work um, and white glove service to the customer as well. One of the executives that I spoke recently described AI like having her own personal assistant, but just a lot better and a lot quicker, you know, a lot of tasks that used to take her days now take her hours. Sounds like you're describing something a little similar. How do you measure productivity? And obviously this is important for some roles, but do you see any roles where um, humans would be fully replaced? There may be. There may be some roles. I think it's like um, a continuum. There are some roles that may be more impacted than others. So, for example, if the role is uh, a lot of transactional work, repetitive work, those are likely to be changed quite rapidly and the deployment of machine learning and AI tools, definitely. Um, but there's the other aspect of it where, particularly in the, the space that I'm in, in, in HR, where people decisions have to be taken. I would not delegate that my people decisions are going to a tool. I think at the end of it, the tools themselves can provide input, they can provide scenarios, they can provide options, but ultimately the line manager or the person in the, the HR business partner has to be accountable for the decisions. And I think it gets into the, the areas around governance and ethics um, and regulation as well around how you train these tools um, and the responsibility of organisations to make sure that this isn't the wild, wild west that there's a, a, le a level of responsibility and oversight in the way that we're using it. And what metrics are you using and how are you using them to measure the impact of AI on productivity? So there's a couple of ones that we're using. So some of them is around retention of talent, so the one that I mentioned earlier. Um, we've also deployed ways in which we're helping improve things like the talent acquisition process. So for example, some of the tools that we've deployed have reduced the uh, amount of time that it's taking to schedule um, interviews with the various hiring managers uh, from something that was taking seven days to something like a few hours because it's all automated now. That also helps from a candidate experience perspective. Um, even time to fill jobs has gone down by 20 days and we just believe that some of that is going to continue to increase as well as the whole sourcing of the talent pools that are available as, as well. Um, there are a number of ways in which we can see that also increasing productivity as well for our, our talent sources. And we know it's not cheap, so talk us through 
how much money you've already put into it or how much money do you plan to put into AI over you know, a certain period of time, and what does the return on investment look like? Yeah, look, my CFO is not here, and he'd kill me if I said something wrong, but, uh, but it is significant investment. I mean, the, the work that we're doing within HR, uh, there is significant investment in just in terms of the, the establishment of the platform, the training up of the employees as well. Um, we have other um, commercial products as well. Some of them that we've been deploying, we've got one uh, called Chat Trends, which essentially our data and services business that basically provides consulting services to our clients, uh, we've enabled it in a way that provides our employees, all employees, to use a text box function to be able to get information uh, that's publicly available, but in, uh, in a very, very quick and effective way. Um, so it's those kinds of things that we're continuing to invest in. We've got another tool which is called Shopping Muse, which again helps um, consumers uh, decide you know, what clothes they're going to wear for a spring wedding and you put in a number of parameters and it actually does the shopping with the merchants that have signed up to that particular thing. So that is a good way as well in terms of driving uh, revenue. And then the final use case is around, we have a product called Safety Net. So this is really a fraud prevention tool. So many of us have got um, individual fraud alerts that come from banks that will say, hey, um, is this really you that's spending this money at a particular merchant in this particular country? We've also got this tool which basically looks at, um, at an enterprise level, bad actors that may be going after some of the financial institutions that are partners with us. And that has saved $20 billion of potential fraud threats. So there's real dollars that can be connected to some of these products that we're rolling out and continue to roll out as well. It's very interesting that, you know, a lot of us know MasterCard from our consumer experience, and now we're getting a little bit of insight of what it looks like to work within MasterCard. And you always say that you feel like your employees need to be treated like your consumers. So talk to me about what you're doing on the consumer side with AI and how does that compare and how do you bring a similar type of experience to the employee of MasterCard? Yeah, I mean, MasterCard is a B2B business. Um, and so we work through our merchants, government, banks, and so forth. So a lot of the work that we do is in partnership. We have one um, particular product called Launchpad, uh, where we work with our, our customers um, to do particular sprints. So they may have a particular use case that they're working through. And, uh, and we use a variety of tools to actually help them develop a prototype at the end of the three-day or four-day period on whatever the issue is that they're, they're looking to solve for their customers. So they're sort of, uh, that's one particular case. Um, but getting back to the, um, to the HR side of it as well, this whole part around um, how AI is changing the way that we think about work um, and skills, it really is a change management uh, uh, effort. And I think the more that organizations are embracing uh, the technology and the trends that are happening and bringing the workforce along with it, and thinking very diligently about how jobs will change and what skilling is required along the way, um, that is absolutely an important imperative because the technology is one thing that can be replicated. It's the way that you actually mobilize the workforce around it um, and doing it in a, again, back to a, a responsible way. We've got a really good question from the audience here in, in talking about skills, right? I love to tell people the story of being a journalist and my young journalists are way smarter than I am. They can use technology way better than I can, but they cannot pick up the phone and call someone to get a piece of information. So tell me about in your role, what skills that are unique to humans that when you look at it and say, I'm sorry, but AI is not gonna be able to do this. Yeah, well, I think um, there, are, there are aspects around um, org organization design, right? Organization design, most people just look at it, a couple of boxes and lines and charts and so forth. But underneath all of that, um, you could ask a, a tool to actually help you design, but it won't have the nuances. And I think those kinds of areas where you need to understand the context is a really important part of it. So I think some of the higher order decisions um, and context making, at this point, AI tools will struggle to be able to do that. I think that's a, a particular skill. And therefore, from a, um, a, a people perspective and a skill perspective, that aspect about judgment and decision making, um, rational thinking, 
all of those are really critically important for, uh, for employees at all levels of the organization. Do we ever get to the point where the machine is able to make those sort of decisions or? It, it, they'll get better. I think, they'll get, I think it's like anything, you, you continue to train these tools and these models and they'll get better and better. Um, it's, it's still too early to say how, how accurate they'll be. And I think, a, again, the important part of, of all of this is really making sure that um, the humans and the, the individuals are really, um, really ensuring they're validating everything that, that is coming from these tools uh, that we're beginning to develop and, and seeing being rolled out. And if we can go back a little bit to the part where we're talking about fraud, I think this is a real concern for consumers and users of credit cards out there. I think most of us know someone or have experienced ourselves fraud with our credit cards or, you know, how is AI helping? Can you give us a couple of examples? And, and um, obviously you work with your issuers. How, you, how is MasterCard using AI and working with the issuers to actually reduce fraud? Yeah, so, there, so one example is um, even just the, the use of your, your device, whether it's a, whatever your smartphone device. We have, we have got um, tools there that will actually recognize the way that you hold uh, your device. Um, obviously, the digital identity aspect is an important uh, way in which of, of identifying that it's you that's making that transaction. So there's some of the, the tools that we've embedded with some of the uh, merchants and issuers that we have um, as customers. And then, as I mentioned, that other one, which is more at the enterprise level, the safety net, which is looking at enterprise-wide uh, potential threats of, uh, of fraud of the financial system or payment flows. That is another uh, particular way in which we're helping uh, some of our, our customers in that space. And when you look into the future and you look at the jobs that you have now, and MasterCard, and you think about how you were, the way you were taking AI, um, how do you see these jobs changing, and what new jobs do you envision that maybe you don't have right now? Well, I think some of them, uh, things like you know, being able to um, develop. So, so we've got software engineers at the moment, they're using particular coding languages. There are ways in which that can be supplemented with some of the AI tools that are available there. There's one that's out there, which you may have heard of, called Devon, which basically you can provide it with, um, you know, language that, that we're speaking and give it particular commands, and it will develop some code. You then need to understand how that code is being developed and whether it's, it's got any bugs in it and so forth. So I think there's those particular tools that can actually help some of the productivity. Um, and I think the other one is around thinking about uh, the issues that workforces are facing as well, things like health and well-being. Um, and so having prompts within the, the technology and tools to remind people to take a break or you're about to send an email when it's um, you know, midnight in a particular location, giving you those kinds of prompts as well, I think these tools can really help benefit in many ways the workforce as well. I'm also really interested in the working from home and the hybrid work that has changed people's schedules. You know, when you're in the office, you are not, you know, as I say, taking your dog for a walk, you know, baking your meringues and picking up your kids at school and, you know, all of the things that people really truly enjoy because it's made their lives better and more flexible, but at the same time has had an impact on productivity. Is there anything that you can say about how AI can help companies manage that you know, productivity in the hybrid, I mean, workforce world, because I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, I think, um, I think the tools themselves can, can help um, with some of these nudging uh, facilities that they have. So, for example, um, you know, we've got ways in which the, the tools can say to a manager, like it will say to me, hey, Michael, you haven't met with um, Jay, Jason uh, for a number of um, days. Uh, do you want to do a, a, a catch-up meeting with it? So those kinds of things, when managers are really busy, helping them remind them about certain rhythms that are happening during the, the month or the, the week uh, or the, the year uh, around career development discussions or performance or just catch-ups as well, I think it helps in those particular ways. Um, and I think the other way is just in terms of just giving people a, a, a sense of it's not always the technology itself. You have to supplement it with policies and other programs as well 
um, to ensure that you're looking at the overall ecosystem and the end-to-end -end value proposition for your workforce as well. Michael, this is great. For this audience, full disclosure, I do have four dogs. Okay, guys. Um, <laughs> so no problems, anyone walking their dogs. It was a pleasure Thank to you, help have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you.